Hi, everybody. This is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio in Las Vegas. Here's where we get to dive into deep conversations with some of the original gangsters of cuisine. Ocean Rays is the name of this podcast, and we're all globally connected by the oceans and the food culture that it shares. Today, I get to speak with a man that is known as the father of Southwest cuisine, Chef Dean Faring, born in 1955 in Kentucky. He was the, uh, the son of a uh, Kentucky innkeeper and uh, went to the Culinary Institute of America, graduated, and then he spent 20 plus years as an executive chef of the mansion on Turtle Creek. He put the mansion on Turtle Creek on the map and he, him and the mansion were inseparable. If you thought about Dallas, you thought about the mansion, you thought about Dean Faring. Um, and then about 20 years after he was there, he left out on his own to become a partner up with the Ritz Carlton and uh, open up Faring's restaurant. That's doing incredibly well. He's a cookbook author. <clears throat> he wrote three books. Um, first one, Mansion on Turtle Creek, cookbook. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then he wrote uh, Dean Faring's Southwest Cuisine, Blending Asia and the Americas. So this man has some fusion um, influences in him that are very well recognized. And he also wrote in 2014, the Texas Food Bible, from legendary dishes to new classics. He um, has uh, done several appearances on PBS uh, with a great chef series. Uh, I remember watching that in the 1980s. It was awesome. And uh, I mean, these were my idols, you know, uh, when I was a young cuisinier. Um, he's uh, hosted a national television show on Food Network called uh, Entertaining at Home with Dean Faring. Um, since he opened his restaurant at the Ritz-Carlton and Zagat Guide uh, gave him the top spot and the best in hotel dining, Esquire Magazine, Restaurant, restaurant of the Year, and Table of the Year. Uh, nominated by the James Beard Foundation for Best New Restaurant, uh, included on top national list by the TheDailyMeal.com, Gaillot.com, and several others. Um, he's recognized uh, by the Culinary Institute of America as the pioneer of American cuisine. <clears throat> Food Arts Magazine honored him on, uh, at the end of the, the magazine. It was this page that I always look forward to seeing who was being recognized uh, as the Silver Spoon Award. And uh, Dean, of course, has also accomplished that wonderful um, achievement. And uh, he's uh, not only a celebrity chef, but he's also a country recording artist. So has two bands. Um, one out of Dallas called the Lost Coyote Band, and also he has a, a alternative country group called the Barb Wires. So he's very active on the guitar, touring as an artist, you know, between food and, and music. He's a good guitar connoisseur collector, um, wears the most outrageous boots in the world and lights up a room when he comes in. You know, customers feel um, fortunate to have had him touch the table. He comes, he smiles, he brings joy and happiness to everyone. He's the ultimate uh, hospitality individual. Um, he loves the rich flavors of Texas and Southwest, uh, peppers, chilies, jicama, cilantro, tomatillos, fruits, vegetables, the Gulf uh, seafood is close to him, and hill country wild game. All of these things are what define uh, his bold flavors that have no borders at all. Um, I want to welcome... Chef Dean Faring today to have some conversations and uh, to learn a little bit more about who he is, his background growing up. So here's the deal. I uh, screwed up. I uh, forgot to start the recording. So we're going to cut right in and Dean's going to be explaining a little bit about how he was working with his dad and how uh, his interactions as a, as a, as a young uh, aspiring cuisinier, he didn't know at the time, he was going after music. And he's telling the stories of um, the interaction between him and his father. So let's go right into it. I had to put the baked potatoes in, you know, I had to pull things out of the freezer, you know right, I mean? right. and, and so, but I, I really liked it. And, you know, we were talking the other day I don't know if you remember those crab apples that were in the number 10 can, the whole crab apples. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My dad was like, that is the perfect garnish for every plate. <laughs> I open up about two cans of crab apples and you would put a whole crab apple. I don't know if anybody ever ate them, but it looked nice for my dad was like, that's a garnish. And so then I got to a point where I told my dad, I said, you know what? I really want to be a musician. 
and I'm, I'm going to quit cooking. And my dad said, ho, 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 hold on, hold on. He says, listen, there's a gentleman that just started at the community college for the culinary arts program. And would you just do me one favor before you go down the honky tonk road of music? And he said, go down and talk to this guy. So my dad made an appointment. I go down, reluctantly, I was kicking the whole, I was like, dad, I don't want to do this. I don't want to cook. I want to play music. He goes, talk to the guy. So I, I walk into this kitchen at Jefferson Community College, Louisville, Kentucky. And there's this little man with the cocked toque, mm -hmm. pencil thin mustache, the neckerchief, permanently pressed chef coat, aprons, and he's standing there with a clipboard. And he goes, are you Dean Fearing? I said, yes, sir. He said, come into my office. I walk in his office and he says, uh, do you know how to saute? And I said, uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, do you know how to braid? And I'm like, uh, that's foreign to me. He says, do you know what a rotisserie is? And I'm like, uh, I don't know if I know that language. So he goes on with all of these terms that I have no idea what he's talking about. And he says, I can show you how to cook. And I was like, huh. And then he got called out of the office and I look above his desk and he has this certificate and it says Ritz Hotel, London, 1920, 1924, apprenticeship signed by Augustus Escoffier. No way. No joke. <laughs> and I go, holy moly. I like this guy is the guy. And he comes back in and he says, I want you to start 7.30 tomorrow. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and he liked me. You know, he saw my resume as a, as a young kid. I you know, spent my whole life at Holiday Inns and cooking. And, and he saw a spark in me. So he took me under his wing. Now, granted, this is a guy that was a master chef for Hilton Corporation in the East, all through Hawaii, all through Asia. And he retired at 72, married a 32-year-old bombshell that was absolutely gorgeous. So this kind of shows you the personality of this guy. And I'm like, you know what? I want to be know, that guy. <laughs> I, 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 this is my mentor right here. <laughs> And Linda was his wife. I'll never forget her. And she also worked in the kitchen. And, it, and this guy, his penmanship, his mother was a duchess in waiting and would drop him off in the Bentley at 4.30 in the morning to start lighting the stoves at the Ritz-Carlton. Wow. I mean, a crazy story. But his penmanship, because I was still working nights with my dad, and I'd want to do a special. And I'd like, uh, let's say, uh, Chef, how do you make chicken teriyaki? I'm going to do that tonight. Sure. He would write out the recipe to me. And I still have these recipes. <laughs> Perfect penmanship. I mean, like, unbelievable. So. so you put those in your book, huh? Yeah. <laughs> So is that where you got the, so the Asian influence? There, there is some Asian influence in your, in your oh, yeah. scene. Oh, yeah. Well, I've always loved it. I mean, who doesn't? Who doesn't? So to finish this up quickly, how I got to culinary. Okay. So I spent two years apprenticeship with him, worked side by side with him. He opened up a little restaurant at nights. I'd go over and help him. And, and he showed me how to work the brigade, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I graduated. And he comes up to me and he says, that was in May. And he says, I have a starting date for you at the Culinary Institute of America on September 28th. He said, be there. And I said, yes, sir. So I got it together, spent the summer saving up, you know, your pocket money sure. and headed out 
all the way from Louisville to Hyde Park, New York, and got in and 76 yeah. and fell in love. I mean, fell in love with the whole area. I haven't been up in that part of New York before, how mm -hmm. quaint, how beautiful, how historic. And then being on the Hudson River there, I mean, unbelievable. So uh, started yeah. off my career. That's pretty much when the Hyde Park, that's when the Culinary Institute was pretty much just moved into that, uh, that it campus. It was old. And, and uh, yeah, my dorm room was the top floor facing the front of the building. <laughs> oh, was it really? Because I was okay. in, but that's in Roth Hall, right? You're way up on a you're yeah. on the top yeah. floor up there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know how we didn't know each other more because, I mean, I went to, I went to the Culinary Institute of America the same years. I graduated in 78. And I, I'm surprised we didn't either. But, you know, we all kind of got locked into our, you know, our, our group, you know. And what month did you graduate? Because I want to know, because I was a fellowship at the, at the final. Yeah, I might have I graded you is what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, uh, it was October 78. It's the same. Hmm. No way. It's totally. I, I graduated in October, uh, 88, <laughs> uh, 78. Yeah, yeah, same here. Oh, boy. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Well, we're, so we're kindred spirits in, in, in regards to that. So how did you end up in um, Texas? I'm your Kentucky boy, you know, Louisville. You well, say it perfectly, so we know you're from there. Story, uh, the luck of the draw. I mean, I've always, you know, during that period, you and I, same way. Mm -hmm. I was enamored by the master French chefs, you know, Trago, everybody, yeah. you know, Elaine Chappelle was my God to me. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely wanted to work in a great French restaurant. Well, near us in Louisville, Kentucky, is the Masonette was in Cincinnati. And that was at that time, the oldest mobile, I mean, oldest, uh, five, three-star, well, it was five-star restaurant at that time. Right. And it, the mobile guide? Yeah, the mobile guide. Sure. And it's five stars. Oldest restaurant at that time, and that was 78 at 35 years, and which was incredible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd been there, you know, on dates and stuff like that. You had to save up a ton of money when you were you know, that young. So I've, we've always known about it. You know, my parents would save up their nickels and dimes and go there once a year. I mean, it was kind of that place. So I, I, George Hayden was the chef at the time, been there for thousands of years. I know that. And he, I kept on sending my resume to him because I just wanted, never heard a word, never. And I thought, frick, you know, I'm not going to get in. So it was getting close to October, you know, I needed to find a job when I got out of school. Mm -hmm. So I took this job in Kiowa Island at, at a hotel there as a saucier. And I was like, okay, well, at least I'll, I'll just move on. Sure. And it was the day, this is so crazy. It was the day before I left to go to Kiowa. I was at my sister's house in Louisville and all of a sudden the phone rings and she goes over and we're, we're having some drinks and stuff. And, uh, and she can't understand the person on the other line. She goes, sir, I, I, I don't understand you. And then she holds the phone and she goes, Dean, I, I think this guy's French and he wants to talk to you. So I, I get on the phone and he, and it's George Hayden. And he says, I want you to come up tomorrow and interview. And I was like, holy moly, here it is. So I went, I, I didn't even have a suit at the time. Uh. So I had, to, my, I had to go over to my uncles and my brothers and I scrapped the suit together. I must have looked like a poor immigrant boy, you know? And, and like the, the, I'll never forget the pocket of the sport coat was ripped. I had to keep my hand up to my side the whole time I was up there. Same. I mean, so, we have such a similar story. It's crazy. Keep going, please. Though. Well, and I get up there and, you know, here's 
here's God's gift to the restaurant world. I mean, I walk in and it's all French, you know, and there's a couple of scrappy Americans there getting the tar beat out of them. <laughs> but I didn't care. So, and they were screaming and yelling all over the kitchen. And, you know, it was, it, I mean, the adrenaline rush when I walked in there was like mm -hmm. this. And I got the job. So I went back home and got all my stuff, came up and lived there and found this cool apartment right on the Ohio River there. It was great. Met a bunch of people at work. Uh, we were all just young Americans, just trying to start off our careers and just had the best time there. And then finally, after about a year and a half, Chef comes up to me. I kind of worked my way up, saucier and all of that. And he says, I have a job for you. And I was like, sure, where? And he says, uh, at the Fairmont Hotel in Dallas, Texas. And he says, a good friend of mine needs a passonnier there. And it's a great, great restaurant. And you're done here. You need to go. And I said, sure. So I packed up everything. And I drove, I'll never forget my first side of Dallas. I'm driving into Dallas, city limits, and it's nothing but new. Everything, it's sparkling, brand new city. Yeah. I mean, I'm from the Midwest. I lived in St. Louis, Chicago, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Cincinnati, old Rust Belt, old River Towns, nothing. Mm -hmm. And there's a charm about that, but there's a charm about brand spanking new. And big. I immediately fell in love with Dallas and never left. There you go. That's how you got to Dallas. See, that's a great story, man. I, I love it. Now, but hold so you, what's that? <laughs> so <laughs> can I go back to the Masonette? Because there's a great fish story there. Oh, yeah, I, of course. Well, we're going to get the fish. Go ahead. Tell me your fish story. So You're dying. I have to tell you, Rick, okay. my great and one and only amazing fish story. <laughs> Go so, for it. We, working at the Masonette, the chef gets all of us chefs together and says, tomorrow there's a shipment coming from the Paris market, and we're going to be the first in the country to bring fresh fish packed in ice from the Paris market, fish wow. market. And we were like, oh, wow, you know, we didn't know. Right. <laughs> and we were all there cutting the boxes. So it, they arrived, they were in the alley. Mm -hmm. I'll never get right behind the restaurant door, uh, the back door. And the delivery person dropped them off, and there were these huge boxes, boxes I've never seen that big before. Styrofoam and or no? Huh? Styrofoam? Yeah. Were they, were they wearing styrofoam? Okay. They yeah. were the first styrofoam cardboard outside. Yeah. Chef cuts them open, pulls open this top, and it's nothing but ice. And I'm like, wow. And he starts digging through the ice, and he's picking up, oh, Turbo, Brill, Roger. And, you know, we'd never seen any of this stuff. Right. We were cooking salmon and, you know, halibut and stuff like that. But nothing like this so it was the first so he says maybe first in that area i don't know but he said it was the first fresh fish delivered in america now, i don't know if that's true or not but maybe it was for cincinnati but anyway it was the coolest thing ever because we'd never seen it. and then you know i was passionier at the time so i'm cooking all of these Oh, my God. Unbelievable. And, you know, Chef was like the proudest guy in the world because he got to say, you know, this is fresh fish. And he was charging a fortune for him and everybody was buying it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Times were a little different than they are right now. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I remember getting live langoustines. And yeah. That, and we didn't know what to do with them. You know, really. Yeah. 
eh, you know, you, you know, you, you turn to the, to the chef to give you the direction on it. And that's how you sure. learned it. Sure. And then, and you never forgot it. That's, those are the greatest influences ever. So, okay. So let's go fast forward today. What's going on? I mean, you're at the Ritz Carlton of, I don't mean exactly during the pandemic. I mean, I'm just talking about in general, what's on the menu at the, at, at, at the fairing set. The, the Ritz yeah. Carlton. So my business partner, John golf, I was at the mansion and was really wanting a change by then. And, you know, you asked the question, I didn't, I didn't move too far in my career because actually I wanted to model myself as the master French chefs, you know, the Trago brothers, they weren't moving around. Elaine Chappelle had his own restaurant, you know, Bocuse had his restaurant, but, you know, uh, uh, Cedric had his own restaurant, La Orchestra. And so anyway, it, that's kind of how I modeled my career. So, but I was wanting a change when John came over and said, you want your own restaurant? I said, sure. He says, let's put it in the Ritz. Well, it was handy because he's the owner of the Ritz. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's helpful. The building, the whole building. So he and I became partners. Great partnership 13 years later john golf and i still run this thing and it's great and it's fun and you know it's hard to imagine 13 years and we did our best year ever last year and which was ironic now that it's the worst year <laughs> we've ever done it, it has a way of balancing it's itself out now doesn't it <laughs> yeah go to the top to the bottom all in one year. <laughs> heard, heard. I but, mean, go ahead. Everything's good. Uh, you know, I'm constantly at the restaurant. I do a little consulting on the side and uh, have some car dealership with Lexus and all of that. I'm one of That's their right. masters. So, you know, it, so it's so it's fun. I, and playing and writing and Guitar is still a major influence in my life now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's always fun. Robert Del Grande from the Annie in Houston. Yeah. He and I songwriting partners since 85. So, you know, we've been writing, God, we must have written 60 or so songs by now. That's amazing. Well, I need to, I need to get a copy of your CD, Chef, that's for sure. Well, you we're know. working new one so we'll make sure you get the new one yeah so what's on what's on your menu right now let's let's talk about your your menu well, what, with i mean i know you have you have several different areas right you, you might yeah, why, don't you, well, why don't you give us a lay of the land a little yeah the lay of the land is i wanted to do something totally different and uh bill johnson was my interior designer and he's an old hippie and i'm an old hippie so <laughs> we got we got along great and i said bill there's two things i want I want a timeless restaurant, and I also want different rooms. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. I can give you the timeless restaurant, but no, you, you want one giant room. I said, no, I don't want a giant room. I don't want somebody walking in at the end of July when it's 107 in Dallas mm -hmm. and nobody's on the road as far as business travelers. Everybody in Dallas is out of town on vacation and they walk into a giant empty room. I said, it's psychologically, people think they're at the wrong space. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, let's break it down into different architectural rooms so that on a slow night, we could close off rooms and still capture the energy in one room so that people walk in, they're automatically psychologically excited about being there and rick if i only did one thing in my life right that's it that's right it. it works to the t and is this, this so, is the same menu throughout the, the, menu, the, the all the way through i mean we got a bar menu mm -hmm. and but it's the same menu all the way through so i have a fine dining white tablecloth room we call the gallery mm -hmm. and then i got a kitchen room it's high energy and it's wrapped around the whole working kitchen. So you see fire, smoke, yelling, screaming, all of that stuff. <laughs> then there's a 
glass pavilion that you look out into our garden and the whole outside that has alfresco doors, these big doors that can open up in beautiful weather and you feel like you're eating outside. We also have an outside dining area and we have a patio area over in our bar that we do live music and we serve dinner out there, you know, whatever. There's, the main thing is there's no rules. If somebody wants to eat at the bar, dinner, be my guest. Right. You know, they be outside eating at the bar, be my guest. The problem I think a lot of people have is they make these crazy rules that don't apply to us nowadays. No one wants to hear the word no anymore. No, it, it has to be removed from your vocabulary. It has to, absolutely. Yeah. And if the one thing I've learned is if we have it in-house, I'll cook it up. It doesn't make any difference if somebody wants scrambled eggs and bacon on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. It's not a price point or trying to be cheap. That's just what they want. It may be the most expensive scrambled eggs and bacon, but that's not the, <laughs> that's yeah. not the story. It's about, it, you know, it's, it's hospitality. And that's what I miss. <laughs> that's what I miss so much right now. It's just being taken care of, you know, it's just being, oh. being, knowing that you're being watched over. And, and that's yeah. exactly what, that's what you described to the T. And that's what you are, man. It's just, so, you know what, but you know, in this industry, it's so funny. It's small. You know, you, 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 you get to know everybody. You know all, you know all the players in your arena. You know, obviously, you have Robert and you've got Steve and, you know, Steve yeah. Piles and et cetera. These are, these, these are the, you know, the, the three musketeers in my mind of, 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 of really uh, identify the, the Southwest cuisine, you know, it, it, for everyone. Um, but rumors about, you know, and, and I just want to know because I, I never heard any of this story. Maybe you could tell me the story of um, how you almost killed Julia Child. <laughs> I was told to ask, you know, so, I mean, I have to bring it up. Well, I tell you, it's a funny <laughs> story, and it's a true story. And so we're doing the master, Julia's master chef filming. And, you know, I'll never forget the taxi drops me off in front in Harvard, and, uh, and there's her house, you know, and I'm getting out of the cab. And it's, it, and she, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it was at the time, but it was the professors, it was the old professors' homes for Harvard uh, during the 30s or 20s and 30s. Right, originally. One of these homes. And there's this sidewalk going down to the front door. And I'm actually scared, you know, and it's like, wow, I mean, this is, this is the big moment. So I walk down the sidewalk and there's a screen door and I knock on the screen door. And you know, when you knock on a screen door, it kind of batters. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's this little bit of hesitation there and wait. And all of a sudden the door slowly creaks open and it's Julia Child. And she goes, Dean, come on in, come on in. So, we go in and she goes, uh, the film crew's not here yet, but uh, why don't we go into the kitchen? And you walk into that iconic kitchen where her husband outlined all of the pots and pans and utensils <laughs> yeah. on that egg board. And, you know, you're looking at that going, holy moly, you know what I mean? I'm in Julius' kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and that was monumental to me at that time. And, and you and I have been through a lot of monumental things in our career, but this was one of them. Of course. Are you kidding so me? Day two and production teams there. We get, you know, it was the old day when three cameras were on you and, and lots of lights. And I'm setting up for the next dish. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't use like you couldn't put Heinz ketchup up there. You couldn't put Tabasco. So uh, the bottle, because they didn't want right. the labels, low labels. So uh, I had to take the Tabasco and I put it in this little container. <laughs> and then I'm over and I'm fiddling with something else. And Julia comes out and goes, oh, uh, what are we going to be doing? 
And I said, you know, we're going to do this uh, molasses glazed duck and uh, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, so she's noodling around and she puts her finger right, our full finger, right into the Tabasco and puts it up to her mouth to taste it. And then all of a sudden, she starts choking and she's choking. Man, and like, I turn around and she can't catch her breath. And Jeff Drummond, the producer, is across the table from us. I've never seen a guy hike <laughs> over a hurdle as fast as he did and gets her to sit down and she is still coughing. And I'm looking in total, like, scared out of my wits of watching this woman die right in front of me because she can't catch her breath. Wow. Finally, it seems like minutes, and she gets back, and she takes a deep breath, and she looks up to me, and she says, Ooh, that was spicy. <laughs> you think? Oh, man. It was the most grateful words I've ever heard in my life because oh. imagine the rest of your life people pointing at you going there the guy. he's the guy he killed he's it. the guy that killed <laughs> hey, where could you go you couldn't go anywhere in this world <laughs> that's so funny that's a great great story and Jeff Drummond looks at me and he goes would you kind of watch that in the future? I'm like, yes, sir. I'm Jeff. Yeah, exactly. He's a good guy. He's a really good guy. Oh, great job. So, so when did you start? Uh, okay, so I mean, I think of you. I think of uh, guitar, and I think of boots. So what's what's yeah. the what's the boot story there, Dean? What's going oh, on? Oh my, the boot story is my whole life, pretty much. You know, I always loved boots. It mm -hmm. was there was something about it. But I never had a great pair of boots. You know, I'd get some dingoes or something or fry boots. Or fry boots. We, we loved fry boots in the 70s, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they were great. And, but, you know, they weren't cowboy boots. And I got to Texas and discovered that I loved real cowboy boots. And... I, I was still hadn't gotten up to the Lucchese range yet. I was still at Nakona and Justin, and they were all right, but they weren't comfortable. You know, you'd wear them a couple of hours and your feet are hurting. And, and I just never found them comfortable, but I wore them because I loved them. Right. The president of Lucchese started to be a regular customer at the mansion. And his name was... Tillerson. And he says, do you have a pair of Lucases? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I want, I mean, that's my pride and joy. All of a sudden, about three weeks later, a box arrives he, and he said, what's your shoe size? And uh, I open it up and it's red pair of boots. And I mean, I was so brass at those times. I mean, it, it was all about color. You know, there was nothing black, gray about me at all. It, mm -hmm. it was like pure color. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I mean, pointed red. And I slipped them on. And Rick, I, I don't think I took them off for three weeks. You know, I slept in those things. It was like a comfortable pair of boots I ever had. And that started me off down the Lucchese Road. And I have now over 50 pairs of Lucchese boots. And you one got, on. You got one. a real problem, Chef. Man, I'm going to tell you something. Looks like Jimmy <laughs> Choo's on there. I know. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Guitar. Is, you know, give me something. <laughs> that is so cool, man. So you worked in the kitchen. You, got, you walked around. Do they, you slide them in, in the kitchen? Is it slippery? Is, there, is it? Are they man, good? I, are they good? Uh, maneuver your way through. I mean, I wear a pair of boots, Lucchese boots every day when I'm at work. They're that comfortable. They're like slippers to me. And, uh, See, I've uh, never had Lucchese boots. Let's knock on wood that I haven't slipped yet. <laughs> but yeah. There's been a couple of close calls where, you know, a little piece of water will, sl and I'll slide a little bit, but I've always 
caught myself, but no, they're, they're great. I work all day long at them. That's and the, you know, I'm, I mean, I wear, but uh, I forget what the name is. You know, I wear shoes, uh, real shoes now, you know, yeah. because, you know, you know, I'm not sauteing. I'm not working a station like I used to work, yeah. you know, or even, even expediting, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm not involved on that level. I'm, I'm the master development oh, chef for no. restaurants. No. Believe me, when I was on the on the line, mm -hmm. the Birkenstocks. Okay, <laughs> yeah. There's the hippie in you again. <laughs> oh yeah. No, when, when I became who I am now, <laughs> it's all. Right. Well, that's <laughs> awesome. So I'm gonna. Get, I want your influence because uh, the name name of this podcast is uh, is uh, Ocean Raised. So. We, Talk a little bit about, um, you know, in your career, you know, you've, you've been in this industry now 45 plus years, I would say, something, something along that line. Sure. Um, seafood. Now, I know Gulf Seafood, Texas, that's, that's pretty much the, uh, the connectedness, but it goes beyond that. I mean, you opened up a box from France, from the first box of, in America from France, you know, it's, it's Cincinnati. So, Tell me, tell me your your uh, your feelings about seafood and, and aquaculture and where we're at today. And, and you know, because I'm I'm trying to take a little bit of a, a on the spot census. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll make it very clear as far as in a Dallas scene. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when in the '80s and early '90s, people didn't eat a lot of fish in Dallas. People. Ladies didn't eat lamb. You know, lamb was too gamey. Uh, they definitely weren't eating wild game. And, you know, I made a consistent effort at all times to have lobster, to have shrimp, to have seafood on the menu. Always had two fish on the menu, still do. And it is important that I felt that we had to bring what was really good for us because red meat is not, I mean, you can't eat a steak every night. It, it's ridiculous to even I try. try. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the health aspect of seafood is where I was always, always going for. And because I think it's important for diners to come in and be able to eat healthy. You know, I th what we learned, you and I both, in the French days was, wow. You know, I remember in a week at the mansion, we would go through 28 cases of heavy cream a week. Yeah. You know, that had 12, you know, quarts of that heavy cream in there. Sure, sure. You know, we used, to, we used to get those big five gallon, you know, uh, plastic bladder boxes with the dispenser. That's where we'd get our heavy cream in. You know, and I would, yeah. And I would, yeah. I mean, gigantic pots was crazy. Morel sauce with cream and butter oh. was insane. Well, I remember in the 80s, late 80s, mm -hmm. the controller of the mansion coming down saying, listen, this cream is killing us. <laughs> Cough swap. Can you lower the amount? And I remember during that time, I said, his name was Rick. I said, yeah. Rick, there's no way. That's the food we're doing. He's like, you got to be able to cut at least five cases down, 10 cases. But it's amazing that now we put a little cream in mashed potatoes and you know, we, we hardly use cream because sure. everything, the sauces, you remember the sauces for, and butter, let's talk about butter, was mm -hmm. all butter sauces or cream sauces in the old day for all of the seafood and fish. Yeah. So, you know, it's amazing what we do now. Everything that I do is light and geared toward health and what I would eat and what you could eat and not kill yourself. You know, I would hear people say, oh, or, or, or self, my own self. I remember going out to some French restaurants and then spinning like a top at nighttime because you got so much. <laughs> so much you, have a lot to work, you have a lot to work off is what it is. A lot of work off. And 
and not being able to go to sleep. I mean, that was how crazy it was. I mean, it was absolutely delicious while you're eating it. Yeah. And you paid the price afterwards. Yeah, well, we so, grew up in it. That's what there was. I mean, yeah. fine cuisine was French, period. When we when yeah. we both graduated from culinary school, that was the that was it, you know. That was it. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I'm opening my first American restaurant in 1981, and the French chefs in Dallas wished me good luck. They said you're going to be open six weeks, and that's it, because there is no American cuisine. It's only French. And I mean, look around. There's hardly a French restaurant around mm -hmm. in, in the real sense of the old days. Uh -huh. I mean, there, there's little bistros in Dallas and all of that that give you the hint of French cuisine, but there's not, in our town, not a true, true old-time French restaurant like you and I were. Well, they were very, I mean, we, it, it became the foundation of what you and I became today. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, techniques to learn how to saute properly, how to fry, how to uh, broil. They didn't know how to grill, really. French didn't grill. As no. we know grilling, they didn't, you didn't have wood and putting marks on it, you know? Yeah, exactly. But, um, but we did learn, but we learned the foundations. They did not evolve. They kept true to their traditions and stayed, stayed, stayed. And one thing that I did learn is that we needed, that I needed to learn to evolve in order to survive. And yeah. To, to, you know, and and you you've said it. I've seen it in interviews with you um, that basically we're here for the customer, not for ourselves. You know, chefs and the ego and all that. It's not. It, that's not the successful chef. The successful chef is looking at what are my customers looking for? What are they needing? What are they? You know, what diets are they they on right now? And and, and evolve with them. You know, and you know, and so that and that that comes into the, the discussion of seafood fish, having two on the menu in, in an environment that is known for, you know, uh, you know, meat, you know, it's cattle driven. There's, there's a lot of cow, a lot of cow, a lot of pig, you know, a lot of, a lot of poultry, but, and then off that, you know, for the, for the next level of interest in cuisiniers, people that like to eat, then you're getting into your quails and your chucker, you know, partridge sure. and all the, the, the game birds and the game food, which I know that you, you love to work with all that because it makes, I would, if I, could, if, I could, if I could sell it, I would. Rick, I also love working with seafood and always have. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to get around with this engaged story, I'm telling you, yeah. is the fact that seafood still sells over 50% of the menu. Mm -hmm. And it's the fact that people understand it now. They understand the health benefit of it. They understand the lightness of it. They understand the taste. The taste is great. I do a chicken fried lobster with a filet. I call it the Texas Surf and Turf. Number one on the menu for 13 years. Right. And people, even from Boston, think it's sacrilegious until they eat it. <laughs> until they eat it. And Breaking they, rules. I get it. I get it. I understand. And when people dive into that chicken fried lobster, there's no turning back. I mean, they, I have them. I have them right there. Yeah. There's like nobody that has eaten that that says, this is horrible. Heard <laughs> you know, like, chef. We chef. You know, well, um, so, but, I mean, some of the new, um, you know, the thing that's me with aquaculture, I'm going to maybe prime the pump a little with, with this discussion is, I know... There was a time in my career where I was like, no, I'm not taking anything from a farm. It's, we're all, we're, it's all you know, wild or nothing, you know? And then yeah. the evolution of the brain and the mind and the realization that we have a big planet out there and, and some things we're over-exploiting. So you, you can't just have the top five uh, you know, players coming from the wild source because it's, it's just not you know, mathematically uh, you know, possible. So, okay, I'm sorry to accept you know, uh, seafood, you know, thin fish. The species that came out of the aquaculture industry as it was developing to me, other than salmon, were boring. Nothing real exciting. I mean, other than the freshwater trout, and catfish, and, and even tilapia, if U.S. farm raised, great, but not great. You know, they didn't end up on our high-end menus. So now, and this is what I'm excited about because it's been a single subject focus of mine for a pretty large portion of my career, is now aquaculture is getting to the point where they're farming um, amberjack. 
you know, like hamachi, yellowtail, delicious, fatty, wonderful fish, you know, consistently and in a manner that's sustainable. I think that that's really, I, I find that is very intriguing. But here's, here's something I've never seen out of a farm. It's Gruber and uh, red snapper coming out of farms. And these are the subsequent species that uh, Forever Oceans is, is, is uh, proposing into the marketplace in 2021. I would love to, you know, get some samples out to you. And I'm not a salesperson. I'm would, just yeah. uh, I, I'm just a guy that embraces cuisine, and, and so are you. So I think it'd be... It'd be uh, oh, I, have, I mean, we have to look toward a sustainable world. There's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, that's the only way this whole whole restaurant business is going to survive mm -hmm. and you know we're doing salmon out of uh bay of fundy i love mm -hmm. i love that in the sense that it's chained salmon and they're living in the environment of course they're fed through the environment but uh you know and living in a inhabitant where they it's the ocean and yeah. you know there's fifty thousand gallons of water billion yeah. the highest water. tides in the world in the world yeah. the bay of fundy so you know it's constantly drifting in and out which mm -hmm. is eating all of this fish so i like that thought of raising fish in the ocean mm -hmm. uh you know they've now moved them onto land that's fine uh and i think they're they're starting to figure it out we have red snapper on our menu right now that we're getting off the coast of Louisiana. Right. Be beautiful snapper. Mm -hmm. So we love the Gulf fish. We love everything about it. The shrimp. You know, I have a barbecue shrimp taco on the menu that just goes crazy. Yeah. Well, you, you, you're known for your lobster taco, right? I mean, that, how, many, <laughs> how, many, how many lobster taco demos have you done, chef? Come on, let's count oh, them off. <laughs> oh. I'd hate to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, man. So let me ask you a question, just out of curiosity. This is completely off topic. I'm, I appreciate your input on uh, on seafood and in, in, in your life. But um, like, if you could do something completely, if, if, you, if you weren't a chef, what would you? What would be your dream job? What would you be? You know, say. Oh, uh, I think we've been talking about it. I would be a musician, first yeah, and foremost. Yeah. You know, I'm a big guitar collector. I I love old Telecasters, old Fender Telecasters mm -hmm. from the 50s, which are really sought out. And I love Martin guitars, acoustic guitars from the 30s and 40s. And uh, I'm starting to build my collection now. And I love that, but I love writing. Uh, I do the music and Robert, for the most part, does the lyrics. And we become this little Lennon McCartney kind of uh, team writing, and it really does work. We just finished a, a new song last week that just knocked us both out. I mean, kind of came out of nowhere. And so, you know, I love that aspect. I'm a big electric guitar player. I got a couple of bands. Uh, we hadn't been playing much through the pandemic, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's been a little bummer, but we're going to start getting back together and and do it safely. And but there's not a lot of live music. We started live music back up at Fearings on the patio, mm -hmm. which right. has been great on Friday and Saturday nights. Get a acoustic group in, and and we're finding that we're all six foot social distancing out on the patio, but it's totally packed, you know. For and I think it's what people want there's 100%. nowhere to go you know there's what to do they're tired of being in the house you know i think we we loved our house for as long as we've been there six months closed in for most part mm. but it's still amazing to me when i get up to a table at the restaurant and someone says this is the first time that we've been out of the house since the pandemic and i'm like wow that is, that's a long time being closed in. It is. I mean, people are reaching a breaking point, I think. You know, I mean, yeah, I think God, so. God, we're human beings. This is how we communicate. Why, yeah. why, why are we not sitting in the same room talking to each other? And I say, hey, come on, pick your guitar up. Let me hear the song you just wrote with Robert, well, you know? I'm dying to hear that, you know? I'm not kidding. It's like crazy, isn't it? Yeah. 
well, you know what? This too shall pass. We'll learn from it. We'll evolve along with it. We're going to be just fine. I'm really, and I truly believe that. I know that the environment is getting to have a, a reset uh, button pushed because, you know, that the pressures aren't on the, the environment as much. We're not, you know, trying to turn everything into a corporatocracy, you know, where we're, we're, you know, that's a fishery. Well, I'm going to own that fishery and I'm going to destroy. These things aren't happening. There's, you know, dolphins are appearing in the canals of uh, Venice yet, and they haven't seen them there in, in decades. So these yeah. are cool things, you know, there's, there's, the world's taking a, a, a fresh breath of air and we're getting a chance to, have, you know, communicate, talk, I mean, you know, make new friends. And then when it, when it all breaks, boom, what a party it's going to be, man. We're going to oh. have one hell of a party. <laughs> It'll be the roaring 20s all over again. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, you know, what? I, I just, you know, I've had you here. I've been talking with you now for about an hour and I just want to wrap it up with you because uh, I could go on and on and on. And I hope to be able to. I hope Let's to be able to get together with you soon, you know. But I want to thank you. Thank you from, uh, this fa for fascinating uh, um, stories that you had to, to, to share with us. And um, I want to thank everybody that's listening in on our podcast today, um, sponsored by Forever Ocean. So uh, this is um, Ocean Raised and Chef Rick Moonen saying thank you so much. And uh, thank you for always being humble and kind, uh, Dean Faring. You are the epitome of hospitality. I love you dearly. Thank you. foreverotions.com